Well, let's, I think we can go ahead and get started. It looks like pretty much everyone's here. Uh, so welcome to the Chemistry of Life Processes Chalk Talk featuring Julia Callow. I'm Sheila Judge. I'm the Senior Director for the Institute and I'll be your host for today. And I'd like to start by um, giving you a brief introduction to Julia, who joined Northwestern as an assistant professor in July of 2016 and is a member of the Institute. Uh, Julia is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, she came to us by way of MIT, where she uh, had a postdoc with uh, Tim Swagger and uh, she completed her graduate studies at Princeton under Abigail Doyle, and she did her undergraduate at Columbia. So uh, she was all East Coast till we nabbed her along the Great Lake. And, um, you know, she, she's had kind of been burning up the lab here. Uh, like, that's probably a bad expression. <laughs> not literally, I hope. <laughs> yeah, not literally, not literally. Uh, but she's, uh, what, her work is being recognized left and right with a, uh, she had a young investigator award from the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research and NSF Career Award. She was recognized this year as a Sloan Fellow and she ha had recent recognition, congratulations, Julia, from the Camille Dreyfus Fund with their 2021 uh, Teacher Scholar Award. So uh, we're all very interested in learning about your research in using light to create tunable polymers. Uh, this is way beyond cool. I'm really looking forward to learning more about what you're doing in your lab. And uh, please go ahead and uh, start sharing your slides and, and we'll take questions um, at the end of the presentation. So strap in everybody, this should be fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sheila, um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I will admit, I mean, I feel a little bit like a, a pretender talking about um, to the Center for Life, you know, to people who know a lot more about biology than I do. So I will admit I am a chemist through and through. Um, and uh, during this project, I've certainly learned a lot more, but there's a lot more to learn. And I'd certainly be very eager to get any feedback from all of you. Um, on, you know, biological directions that might be interesting, um, problems that might, we might be able to ask using these materials. So my title is certainly um, aspirational. It describes what we'd like to be able to do. So to be able to mimic aspects of living materials using the power of light. Um, so in particular, um, we use, as are the materials of choice, we use polymer networks. And when I started my lab, polymer networks were a class of materials that really interested me. Um, and these are basically um, polymers that have um, effectively infinite molecular weight because the strands are interconnected. Um, so you can take, you know, small molecules that as a chemist, you can, you know, look at, know what they are, um, buy them, react them together, and you can make a polymer network. Um, this is an example of a formaldehyde phenol resin. Um, or even in biology, there are polymer networks that might be built up of, say, different amino acids. Um, but what really excited me is that you can not only control these polymer networks from the molecular scale using, you know, the chemistry of the monomers that you put in, but there's this whole other aspect to them, which has to do with the strand topology and the architecture. So these macromolecular aspects that you can't really just capture through the small molecule structure. Um, and what happens um, that I think is really cool is that those details, those molecular and macromolecular details um, combine to create the macroscopic properties of these materials. So by taking the same constituent uh, monomers or components and changing something like cross-linked density, you can go all the way from, you know, a totally liquid um, resin to a very hard, say, billiard ball. And the structural changes that lead to changes in physical properties um, are also important in biology. So one example I like is that of, you know, say the chick embryo, where the tendon, um, the, the proteins in the tendon become increasingly cross-linked, which allows the tendon to become stronger um, and more elastic and eventually allows this developing chick embryo to kick its way out of an egg. So the mechanical change is very important to the function of the material. 
So, um, you know, I'm a chemist, so this was learning about things like mechanics was new to me. Um, probably some of you are experts, but for those of you who are not, um, I wanted to give a very brief introduction and overview. So I'll talk about two different key mechanical properties today. And the first is stiffness. And stiffness tells you, um, I think we all have a very good intuitive grasp. Um, it tells you the resistance um, of a material to deformation from an applied force. So we know that materials that are very stiff, it's very hard to deform them, you know, stretch them or squish them or whatever. It requires a lot of force to do so. Um, so it's expressed as the ratio of the amount of energy you have to put in to the deformation or strain that you achieve. And I think we all have a very good intuitive sense of this in this um, sense that, you know, we know that the material on the left, this cartoon, would yield a much softer material because there are fewer connections between the strands, there are more defects, whereas the one on the right is much more tightly, we would say cross-linked, um, more interconnected, so that yields a stiffer material. Another important property that we think about is stress relaxation. And this is a little more complicated because it describes a time dependent property of the material. Basically, um, materials that are perfectly elastic are like a rubber band where you put energy into the material, so you stretch it, and it stores the energy. Um, it does not dissipate the energy because it has these permanent bonds between the different strands of polymers. And then when you let go, it snaps back to its original size. In contrast, something like um, silly putty can actually flow on some time scale. So we call that viscoelastic. Um, so again, if in cartoon terms, you can think of something that has these permanent um, blue junctions between the strands as being elastic like a rubber band and something that has these exchangeable interactions. So things like hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic interactions can all provide um, reversible linkages between polymer strands that results in a viscoelastic material. Um, so these properties are, of course, relevant in a variety of fields. Um, so, you know, I like to think about, you know, how this might relate to food. It turns out food um, scientists do a lot of rheology to get the appropriate mouthfeel. Um, it's also relevant to self-healing materials. For something to self-heal, it needs to be viscoelastic. It needs to flow. And it's also, of course, relevant to tissue engineering. Um, so if we want to make a material that mimics tissue, we have to capture not only the stiffness, but also the stress relaxation. Um, so I think we know it's been known for a while that tissues have many different stiffnesses and depending on if you, say you take culture cell, stem cells in a material, um, how they differentiate will depend on the stiffness of their environment. Um, and I think, again, this is relatively intuitive, you know, in a soft, uh, in a soft environment, they differentiate towards fat like lineages, stiff environment, they differentiate towards um, bone like lineage. So I, I think that makes sense. What's I think uh, a little bit less intuitive is the effect of stress relaxation. So what this means for a cell is that the cell pushes out against its environment and it senses whether the material pushes back or whether the material flows and deforms and adapts. Um, and that's going to control whether the cell can say migrate or cluster ligands or engage in cell cell contacts. Um, and it turns out that different tissues actually relax stress. So this is showing the dissipation of stress or energy over time. And you can see that all these different tissues do relax stress and they do so on different time scales. Um, whereas, you know, a synthetic covalently cross-linked hydrogel is more like a rubber band where it doesn't relax stress. So it is unable to adapt to applied forces. Um, this becomes important again in cell behavior. So again, to take the example of stem cells, a stem cell that's cultured in a fast relaxing environment will actually tend to go more towards the bone-like lineage, which I think is really surprising. That is less obvious to me, less intuitive to me at least. Um, so overall, what we see here is that the cells, cells respond to mechanics, both the stiffness of their environment, um, so how much they can deform it and how much energy that takes, um, as well as the stress relaxation, so how much their environment um, is able to adapt or um, morph in response to the um, cellular um, deformation. So um, for a long time, researchers have tried to mimic the very complex extracellular environment using synthetic materials that might allow you to very precisely and reproducibly, um, you know, have all sorts of signals or do um, biological assays, screen drugs, and so on. So rather than using, you know, ECM-derived materials, something like Matrigel, can you use synthetic polymers? 
But to do that, you have to build back in the complexity of the um, biological environment. And some ways that people do that, for example, um, might be adhesion sites, um, might be the ability to change um, stiffness in situ um, or have degradable sequences like peptides that the cells have proteases and can um, cleave through. Um, perhaps sometimes you might have you know, biological signals that you've um, actually conjugated to the network. Um, I've just shown just a couple of representative applications here, um, ranging from, you know, actually uh, being able to do drug screening assays in these sorts of environments, um, make, you know, I like this example of making um, a skin equivalent using these sorts of synthetic matrices. Um, and then on the right hand side, I have an example of 3D printing with um, uh, basically a synthetic material to make something that mimics an ear in this case. So I was particularly interested in the fact that, you know, tissue is not static um, and it's not homogenous. Tissue actually changes over time as a function of disease and development. So one example that I showed you in the beginning was the developing tendons. So I like this example from the Kuo lab. Um, and she has studied actually the mechanics of tendon um, in these developing embryos. And she found she could do this mechanical mapping of the tissue. And she found that, you know, as a function of time, as the embryo develops, the tendon becomes not only stiffer, but also more heterogeneous. So you can see that in the different colors in these stiffness maps. So, you know, if you want to mimic this heterogeneity with a, th with a synthetic material, we asked, how might you do that? Um, Another, of course, example I like from the Woodruff Lab, um, formerly of Northwestern, is in uh, relevant to um, oncofertility. Um, and this has to do with um, the way that um, the oocytes receive cues that tell them to mature. Um, and it turns out that, um, you know, the, their environment um, and the ovary is actually quite heterogeneous. Um, so the cortex, um, uh, for example, in the medulla have both different stiffnesses as well as stress relaxation. Um, so one hypothesis in the literature is that it's actually mechanical cues that trigger um, the oocyte to um, mature. So our hypothesis was that in order to get both time dependent and spatially dependent changes in things like stiffness or stress relaxation, we'd really like to use light. Um, because light would allow us to pattern um, different colors of light, um, different intensities of light on a single material. We could also change the intensity, the color um, on or off over time. So we could mimic that sort of spatiotemporal control in an external fashion. Um, of course, you know, um, with light, we'd like to really go again towards the red as well, where it's potentially cytocompatible. Um, so I know not everyone here is necessarily a chemist, so I won't really dwell on the chemical details. Um, uh, for those of you who have forgotten intentionally on purpose um, all of your organic chemistry, but basically I'll just summarize to say that the two key elements we use are um, a dye called a photoswitch, and these are molecules that can absorb light and change their shape in some way. So we use the azobenzene shown here, which you can shine light one um, wavelength of light to go to this more folded conformation, and then you can go back with a second wavelength of light, and it's reversible, and that's important. The other um, component we use is a dynamic bond um, where it can transition between basically debonded and bonded states. Um, and it does so you know, at room temperature. Um, so to show, you know, for those of you who care about the chemical details, I'm showing here the two different types of polymers that we combine. So we just use a very simple, um, you know, common uh, bio compatible polymer, polyethylene glycol, and we use polymers that are terminated with either these um, polyols or with our key molecule, which has both our photoswitch and our dynamic bond. Um, so basically, I'm showing you a vial that contains um, buffer and both of these polymers, and you can see initially it just flows, which shows that the reversible bonds are in this unbonded state, um, so they're separate. Um, but then Joe can actually shine UV light. In this case, this is our first generation material. We needed to use UV light. Um, and basically that transitions, the photo switch switches to the folded conformation and the bonds are able to form. So we're um, basically condensing um, the boronic acid in the dial to make the boronic ester shown here. So then we can take that. Now it's a gel because it's a polymer network swollen by water. And then we can shine blue light on it and that actually returns our material um, to the liquid state. So this debonded state. 
and we can go back and forth again, switching different wavelengths of light. Um, so of course, you know, uh, biologists seem to not really like UV light, um, understandably. So we wanted to make this a uh, more sort of useful and relevant system. So Joe was able to do some modifications to the azobenzene installing these fluorines. Um, and now we can actually use green for the stiffening process instead of UV light. And the stiff state of the polymer is actually, you know, has a relatively long um, half-life in terms of like the thermal stability of this, um, this folded isomer of the azobenzene. So we use rheology to characterize it. Um, I guess all you need to know is that these lines going up, um, the dark uh, squares going up mean the material is getting stiffer. The green background means this is while we're irradiating with green light. Um, and then the blue background means we've irradiated with blue light. And you can see that these um, black squares, it drops very rapidly and that corresponds to the softening. And then when we switch back to green light, it stiffens again. So um, that's showing temporal control and then to show spatial control, Boyang actually did basically the nanomechanical mapping of our materials. And you can see when we use basically a TEM grid to pattern light on our material, you can indeed see regions that are stiffer and regions that are softer. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is that we now have this tool where um, we have photo controlled stiffness, but we can also measure the stress relaxation. So again, this is energy over time, um, and we can just see that the stress relaxation of these materials, even as we're stiffening, the stress relaxation is constant. So we think this is a really nice opportunity to tune only one um, variable in a very complex system. Because um, in most previous synthetic hydrogels, when you change the stiffness, you also change the stress relaxation. It's very hard to decouple those variables. So now we have a way to only change the stiffness and again, have constant stress relaxation. So now we think we have a way to really, uh, you know, in a system, um, understand, for example, whether a biological effect is coming um, from one mechanical signal or another. Um, so to go beyond polyethylene glycol, we've been working on, you know, other types of materials. So we've had, um, you know, some um, progress using alginate based backbones. Um, we've also looked at just mixing our synthetic materials with collagen so we could get the fibrillar um, structure of collagen and also the um, actual adhesion sites that are on collagen. And that's actually been um, uh, probably uh, one of the more successful um, sort of approaches. So we have, you know, the best of both worlds with the synthetic material and the photo response we get from that, as well as all the, you know, biochemical information from the collagen. So not only can we use collagen, we can also use more tissue specific materials. So for example, our collaborators in the Wertheim lab, um, formerly at Feinberg, um, are able to decellularize um, different organs like the liver, and we can use those materials and mix it with our synthetic hydrogels to again, get materials that have this reversible photoresponse. Um, so at this point, I just want to share like a couple of vignettes about, you know, all the fun things we've learned since then when, because we had this system where like, oh, we can, you know, just stick some gel cells in, and we were really quite naive. We've learned a lot since then about how hard biology is. So I, I admire um, everyone who does this. <laughs> um, so um, basically the first thing we contended with was the fact that our gels just kept dissolving. Um, and it turns out this makes a lot of sense because we have this reversible dynamic bond that goes between you know, a boronic acid and a diol to form the ester. And the ester is what links the polymers together to make the network. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to think of it, the, the reagent, the that makes the process reverse is water. And it turns out when you soak these gels in media, you have a large excess of water. So it sort of makes the equilibrium go towards the left. Um, so that was not great. Um, so one of the things we've done is use a small fraction of permanent covalent bonds. So we're just using cyclooctane azide click chemistry um, here. So we can make sure that the network is maintained even though we still have that photoresponsive um, unit in there as well. So we can see that, you know, without the click linkages, we really are, you know, dissolving our gels very rapidly. But now with 33% um, of the linkages being those um, azide alkyne cycloadditions, um, the permanent bonds, we can get much more stable gels, which is obviously important for longer term assays. 
Um, the next question we wanted to look at is how can we introduce cell adhesion sites, since of course the PEG itself um, doesn't have any. So here we're looking both at um, clicking in, you know, um, short peptides like RGD, as well as, as I mentioned, um, just mixing our synthetic hydrogel with um, collagen. Um, so we can also click in um, a dye um, to see whether the polymers, how they're distributed. So for example, here, um, our collaborators in the Shin Lab at UIC have been using these mouse D1 cells um, and they can see the red background here is from the polymer itself. I'm actually not sure why they're, they aren't sure either why there's these red dots. I don't know if there's some dye aggregation, but you can see, you know, the, the green is the cells inside of it and some of them are starting to spread after one day. Um, some other lessons we learned, which um, required actually, you know, looking at the structures of some of these mysterious reagents um, that are used. Uh, we had, for example, in the beginning, this problem where um, in 3D cell culture, um, our collaborators were trying to diffuse in different dyes for the live dead assay. And um, the ethidium bromide worked fine, but the calcium would just like stick to the top of the gel. And then we looked more carefully at the structure and realized that these sort of um, amino dicarboxylic acids look very similar to a common protecting group for boronic acids. So we're, our current hypothesis is that our gel actually is binding um, to the dye. So, you know, basically they just use a different dye and a different protocol and that works fine. Um, the other next question we had is, you know, um, sometimes at the end of experiment, you'd like to dissolve the gels on purpose. Um, so you can do other experiments with the cells without disturbing them too much, like flow cytometry. Um, so initially, Boyan used this molecule that sort of resembles our polymer end groups. Um, but then she found that she could actually just use sorbitol, so the sugar alcohol, and that also is able to um, dissolve the gels very efficiently on demand. So, you know, just one example to show the comparison of the different materials. If you just use a standard collagen gel, of course, the cells spread very happily. Um, with our IPNs, we do see some cell spreading, um, although it's a bit of heterogeneous. So that's something we'd like to understand more. Um, and of course, in the PEG um, gels, the cells are very rounded and don't spread at all, which is what you'd expect. Um, so this is the kind of system that we're looking at moving forward. Um, we're, again, still at a very pre preliminary stage um, in these studies, but I wanted to show you a little bit about what we're trying to do um, and also, you know, some of our adventures and um, learning things that are probably very obvious to many of you. <laughs> we killed a lot of cells in these experiments, basically. Um, but yeah, we're excited about now being able to actually test the effect of, you know, changing stiffness dynamically on cell behavior. So finally, just to um, acknowledge the people who did the work, um, Joe was the one who really started um, looking at this hydrogel system and developed, you know, um, invented the different cross-linkers that we use. Um, and Boyang and Vivian are now pushing forward the materials that we're using in um, cell studies. And our collaborators, particularly in the Shin Lab, have been working really hard on um, using this um, new material um, with cells. And the funding for this project is from the NIH. So thank you all for the invitation, the opportunity to speak, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much, Julia. I, this is just fascinating. And, um, you know, everyone, we'd like to hear from you. I, maybe I can lead off. Julia, as uh, somebody who did cell culture for a number of years, I'm always concerned about whether or not a material is inert. Do you, are there any issues with the polymers that you're generating, um, you know, releasing anything that can uh, cause changes in cell behavior. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's definitely something we want to look at more. I mean, so far we have mostly looked at just cell viability and cell spreading, um, but yes, we would like to do more um, detailed experiments to see whether compared to a control, you know, the cell is, you know, um, acting as it should. I mean, based on the structure, um, I, don't think, I mean, at least there's not small molecules that should be released, but certainly there could be the, the polymers that are released. So I don't have a good sense of whether, you know, like a five or 10 kilodalton polymer is going to be an issue. Sure, sure. So everyone, uh, you're invited to place your questions in chat. We're gonna, um, that'll make it a little bit easier to include all of you. So our first question is from Sherry Hemmingson, and she's wondering if you had any successful efforts with more red shifted dyes or what your plans are for that. 
Yeah, I'm looking through my extra slides and trying to remember what I made extra slides of. Um, I don't know that I showed the right things here. Um, but basically, we do now have uh, azobenzene, a photo switch that can be photo switched with red light. So yeah, that's about as far as we've gotten. Um, although that still only works for the stiffening step. Um, for the softening step, we still need to use blue light. But that is a very brief irradiation um, that actually softens quite rapidly. So, so yeah, I think, you know, uh, obviously red light would be better than green light, but we are trying to figure out now, like what is sort of the minimum irradiation time we can use since I know even green light can be a concern. Yeah, this is the azobenzene, sorry. I don't know if you can see my pointer now. Um, the dimethoxy one where we can use red light. Um, Jody Hirsch asks, are the cells growing in 2D or 3D and does that make a difference? Yeah, so we've tried both. Um, so I believe um, this experiment is in um, 3D and then this one um, is in 2D. So um, 2D is a little bit easier. So that's sort of what we're pushing forward right now, but it, it is possible to do 3D. Alex Anderson asks, have you tried using different boronic acids or diols to change the uh, equivalence of the ester formation? I'm curious about the effect on the stiffness and the stress relaxation of the gels. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have the extra slide in this deck. So that's actually something Boyang has been working on, um, especially on the dial end. Um, so basically, we've found that the um, the boronic acid side, the modifications we've made haven't had a huge difference. Um, so the putting the fluorines there does make it somewhat stiffer. So that's a good thing in terms of making the gels more stable. Um, but for the dials, we've seen very significant effects. But the problem is once we change to different dials, there seems to be something a little bit special about the dial we're using. And that's certainly what other people who make boronic acid hydrogels also use, um, where other dials, um, do not tolerate large amounts of water around. So we can only make like organogels with like 5% water, which is obviously not very useful for biological systems. Um, so we're interested in studying different dials from a fundamental perspective, but unfortunately we can't make useful hydrogels from them because the equilibrium is just in the wrong direction or the kinetics are too slow. Other questions? With those typing fingers moving. So Julia, I imagine that some of your um, collaborators would be very interested to be actually able to see changes in cell morphology and function as you tune mm -hmm. the gels. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be particularly interesting in cancer cells, mm -hmm. for one, um, you know, because there's uh, there's a lot of literature out there about mm -hmm. effects of matrix stiffness on mm -hmm. uh, the transformation of cells yeah. to a metastatic phenotype. Yeah, um, yeah, we haven't certainly thought about doing like real time imaging. I'm not sure if that's what you mean. Um, I'm guessing that would start to be like more of a I don't know, instrument or like geometry question where it's like, how do you irradiate it while you're also getting, you know, microscopy data, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so we might be able to link you up with the Dean Backman who uses okay. spectroscopy actually to okay. cell confirmation at a okay. scale. Um, yeah, cool. Because that could be very cool. So um, Jody Hirsch is asking about cells with mechanically gated ion channels. I don't know anything about which that. Which could also cool. react <laughs> to changes yeah. in matrix. So um, yeah, the, from a pharmacologic standpoint, that would be very interesting. Yeah, I mean, we'd certainly be interested in, yeah, like I said, other systems that might be interesting to study with these materials. Um, 
as long as people are willing to have it, to experiment a little with the material, since we've certainly found that we do have to troubleshoot a bit. <laughs> Julia, are there other applications of this approach that go beyond cell culture? You know, are there commercial applications or other things we should know about? Um, I mean, so I would say for hydrogels in general, there's definitely um, applications in, you know, like screening drugs in more mechanically relevant environments. Um, and um, there's also, you know, interest, I don't know how much of it is commercialized in terms of like delivering drugs, genes, so on with hydrogels. Um, in terms of like light activated hydrogels, I think that's much less in terms of um, the applications out there. I mean, certainly for anything in vivo, you have the issue of how you would introduce light, um, which obviously there's ways to do that, but it certainly requires a bit more effort. Um, well, uh, is, are there potential engineering applications aside from kind of the biological uh, medical? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, another part of my lab is interested in um, polymers for sustainability. So I would say, practically speaking, I'm not sure that um, you're probably not going to replace commodity polymers with these relatively fancy and expensive <laughs> hydrogels or networks. But there is, um, it's at least interesting to think about, you know, could you make a material self-healing with light um, or, you know, change whether it's, um, from a state where it's say recyclable to more um, stable or something like that um, with light. Um, so yeah, certainly there could be other applications that I'm not aware of in terms of, um, I don't know, light responsive like devices and things like that. Well, this is a lot of fun. Anyone else with a question? Trying to give you time to type here. If not, um, thank you, Julia. This was a lot of fun. I've learned a lot of new things from this. And um, thank you to all our participants. Stay tuned. We'll have other faculty chalk talks. Oh, one last question from Cooper Hanley. Have you considered looking at the effects of the stiffness of your hydrogels on stem cell differentiation. Yeah, that's exactly what we'd like to do. Um, and to do that, yeah, we have to start extending the um, length of our experiments out farther than they've been going. Um, but that's certainly the direction we'd like to go in. Um, right now we're looking at cell spreading because that's like sort of a faster response um, for us to monitor. But yeah, certainly um, things like stem cell differentiation would be very interesting, um, especially from the respect of things like cell memory, um, since we have the ability to change the stiffness of the environment without like removing and replating the cells. All right, well, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much, everyone for your time and attention this afternoon and uh, feel free to follow up with Julia on your own. Um, and Julia, thank you again. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.